lesson today and the following lessons. We pray you bless this church, Brother Norwood, and his, his wife Monica and their family and all these that are here and our family members. Please save any of them that's not saved. And Lord, we'll thank you for it. We pray now you bless in this lesson and God give us spiritual understanding that we might live more godly lives. For we ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to turn with me over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Proverbs 4, 1 through 4. And here it says, Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law, for I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Now notice verse 2, he says, I give you good doctrine. What is doctrine? Well, if you have an old King James Bible, you have the doctrine of God at your disposal. That's what it is. The Bible is God's word, and upon that statement lies the hope of all mankind. Without an absolute written authority from God himself, there can be no discernment of right and wrong, good and evil, or knowledge of anything about God and what he requires of man. Without the Bible, man knows not where he came from, where he is, or where he's going. He's like Columbus when he set out to the new world. He didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he got back home, he didn't know where he'd been. I think he was a Democrat. But this is the way men are who have not the word of God. Thanks be to God for his written revelation. Sister Emerson, please read for us 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished in all good works. Thank you, sister. Now, there where it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. God breathed upon holy men and told them exactly what to write, and they wrote it. And that's how we have our Bible today. In 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, back years and years ago, there was a man by the name of Thomas Paine. He was an atheist. He came to America in the year 1784, and he began to write some articles, and people liked those articles he was writing. And, you know, they just couldn't wait to get to, get to them and, and to read them. But one day he wrote a book called The Age of Reason. And in that book, he ridiculed God, he ridiculed the church, he ridiculed Christianity, he ridiculed the, the Bible. And uh, sometime after that, when people began to depart from him and refused to read anything that he put out, he said, I wish I'd never written The Age of Reason. But in that age of reason, he said, in a hundred years, the Bible will be a forgotten book found only in museums or in dusty attics or in the back shelves in, a, in some bookstore somewhere. Well, a hundred years from that time, the Bible became the world's greatest and bestseller. And so, you know, if we as Christians want to live right and grow spiritually, then the Bible must be our life our guide and our spiritual food. And as we consider the doctrine of God's word, we see that it is the word of God that God uses to save souls. Without the word of God, one could not be born again. And I'm going to ask Brother Phil to please read for us 1 Peter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but incorruptible. 
by the word of God, which do and abide it forever. Thank you, Brother Phil. Now notice it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed. These new versions of the Bible are corruptible seed because they've changed verses. They've changed the meaning of the verses. Some of the verses they've left clean out. And you know, the, the fact is, these new versions contain the Word of God. But the old King James Bible is the very verbally, plenarily inspired Word of God. And you know, back about 30 years before the Second World War, there was a missionary that went to a place called Shima, Shimabuka. I think that's how you pronounce it, Okinawa, Japan. And he came into that village and uh, he started, he could speak the Japanese language. He started speaking to those people. And he had the privilege of leading two brothers to Christ, Shoshai Kina and his brother Mojon. They got saved. And he instructed them in the Bible a little bit, but then he had to be moving on. So he left the Japanese Bible with them and he went on his way. 30 years later, the Second World War broke out. And the American troops, when they landed on Okinawa, they came to this village and uh, they had their rifles leveled and ready to shoot any Japanese soldiers they saw, they saw, but there weren't any Japanese soldiers there. And these two men that the missionary had led to Christ, they came out and they bowed themselves and welcomed the American soldiers as Christian brothers. So they called for their chaplain. And they found out the story about these men. And one thing about it, they said when they entered into the, into the huts looking for Japanese soldiers, he said they've never seen anything so clean. The insides of their homes were just spotless. But all the other villages in Okinawa were just filthy, dirty. And that's what the gospel will do. When a person gets cleaned up on the inside, he'll clean up on the outside. That's the way it works. Mm -hmm. And so I want you to look with me. Let's go over to the book of James chapter 1, verse 21. I'm going to read verse 21 through 25. It says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway he forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now you know there's people, they come to church and they hear the gospel of Christ. And when they walk out the front door, they forget everything they've heard. And there are people that pick up a gospel track and they'll read it. And they'll put it down and go on their way and they forget what they read. And that's the way it is with many unsaved people. They just, they, they just do not remember. And maybe they don't want to remember. I don't know. But notice it says, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. The engrafted word means the implanted word. The word of God that God plants in the heart of believers. And you know, God can save anybody if they'll yield to his will and to his word. And you know, back years ago, there was a man named Johnny Cash. He was a, a great country music singer. He won several golden records and, and he was really climbing in popularity. And uh, so because of all the pressure of the places he had to go and play and sing, he started taking pet pills. And uh, so anyway, the pet pills got to where they wouldn't work, and so he went to amphetamines, or however you, however you pronounce that. But, but anyway, uh, he was arrested in 1965 for, uh, with a uh, hundred, I mean a thousand, I think it was a thousand pills they found on him. He went to jail, spent some time in jail, and he got out. He went back on his pills, and he had a wreck. Broke his nose, knocked out four teeth. And uh, so anyway, he just continued to go downhill. And so 
One day he decided to go back home to Dyer, Arkansas. That's where he was from. He went back to Dyer, Arkansas. It was on a Sunday and he went to church and he didn't know what to do because his life was just falling apart. He sat in the pew and the preacher got up and preached the gospel. God spoke to his heart. He had an altar call. He came down to that old wooden mourner's bench and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. Anybody, I don't care who they are, anybody who really wants to be saved can be saved. But pre people that, you know, they hold back any sin in their life, thinking, well, I'll, I'll get saved, but I'm going to continue to do that. God can't save you like that. You have to be totally submitted to the Spirit of God. Without the Word of God, man wouldn't know the truth of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Back many years ago, there was a, this was in Europe, there was a rich man who went to a wise man, supposed to have been the wisest man in the country. He asked him, he said, what is God? He said, well, I don't know, let me think about it. And so he thought about it for several days and the wisest man asked him again. Or not, I mean, the rich man asked the wise man again, said, what is God? He said, I don't know. He said, I can't figure out what God is. And anyway, there was a preacher that heard about that and he got in his pulpit and he said, it's amazing to me how the wisest man in the country can't tell us who God is. But he said, you take the old humble farmer out there plowing in his field who knows Jesus Christ, and he can tell you all about God. And that's the way it is. You know, people have worldly wisdom, but they don't have the Spirit of God. Now, it's the Word of God that brings salvation to a soul. It's what, that's what God uses. It's the Word of God that feeds us once we're saved. If a child does not receive proper food for nourishment, then his growth will be stunted. And even so, if a child of God does not receive spiritual food, he's going to suffer spiritually. You know, I remember reading about a family down in Florida. They had five children. And they were not feeding their children properly. The authority has got a hold of them. This has been back years ago. The authorities got a hold of it and they went to their house. And the oldest boy of the five children was 16 years old and he only weighed 54 pounds. He was just a walking skeleton. And you know, that's the way it is. That's the way it is for a person who's saved, who will not read their Bible properly, don't read it every day, don't meditate on it, don't think about it. And that person is going to be spiritually malnutritioned. He will suffer from spiritual malnutrition. And you know, there's a lot of things in this world that will take up our time if we let it. We need to set aside a time every day where we can sit down and pray, take our time and pray unto the Lord, and thanking Him for His many blessings and asking Him for, for the, the salvation of souls and and anything else that comes to your mind is you need to pray about. It. And then take time to read and study the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God. The Word of God is that food that produces strength and growth for the saved. I'm going to ask Brother Gray to please read for us Job 23, verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. My necessary food. Plants and animals need food. People need food. But how much, how much do we love food? <laughs> Most of us love to eat. But how much love do we have for the spiritual food, the Word of God? You know, I remember reading about a poor blind girl in France several years ago. 
She received a Braille Bible. You know, that's the raised letters and the words, you know, they run their fingers across it and read it. Well, this girl was so happy, she got the Braille Bible and she began to read it. She read it for a number of years. And she noticed one day that the feelings in her fingers were starting to wane, starting to go away. And she started rubbing them on the rocks and stuff and wearing, wearing the skin down and, and still the feeling in the ends of her fingers was going away. And she picked her bright Braille Bible up and she said, Oh God, I'm going to have to say goodbye to your precious word. And she put her lips against the Braille to kiss it. And she felt the Braille through her lips. And she began to weep and thanked God for the privilege of being able to read the word of God with her lips. She loved the word of God. How much do we love the word of God? We can see, we can see to read. We need to read and study and meditate on the word of God. Now, in John chapter 4, verse 32, we see Jesus at the well in Samaria and his disciples had gone into town to buy bread. And they came back and they tried to get him to eat and he said, I have bread to eat that you know not of. They didn't understand that. But then when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, he, he hadn't eaten anything. And he was hungry and the devil came to him and said, Well, now, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread and feed yourself? And uh, Jesus said, uh, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. God has listed how he describes his word as spiritual food. First of all, he refers to it as the milk of the word. 1 Peter 2, verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Sister Gray, please read for us 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2. Thank you, Sister Gray. Now, you know, there was a man that was a Catholic, and he got saved. He stopped going to the Catholic Church, so he started reading his Bible. And the priest came by to visit, but he didn't see why he hadn't been in church. And he saw this man sitting there reading his Bible. He said, you shouldn't be reading that. You, you need to let me read it and interpret it for you. And the man looked up at him and said, you know, back some months ago, he said, I got sick. And I had to hire a man to come and milk my cow for me. And he said, I, I noticed that the milk was real watery. And then he said, I found out that that man was taking half of my milk and filling the pail up for the rest with water. And he said, yeah, I fired him. And he said, now I'm getting that good, rich, sweet milk like I used to get. And his insinuation was that this priest had been stealing his milk, the milk of the word. That's what they'll do. And so, you know, he refers to the Word of God as also as meat of the Word, the heaviest form of food, this spiritual truth. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dunn to please read for us Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For what the time you ought to be teachers, you have need of one teach you again, which is the first principle of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are whole days, even those who by reason of the use of their senses exercise to discern both good and evil. Thank you, Brother Dunn. Now, you know, a little baby will gag or choke on a piece of meat. They will. And, and you know, uh, but it gives strength to the adult. You know, of course, steak's getting so high, now you can't afford it. All the other kinds of meat is too, you know. And the prices just keep going up. But, but anyway, you know, in, in 1 John, we see that John gives us different stages of spiritual growth. In 1 John 2, verse 12, he mentions the little children. 
And then in 1 John 2, 14, he mentions the young men. And in 1 John 2, 13, he mentions the father. So this is the different stages of spiritual growth. And, and then as we move on, notice he, refer, he refers to the word of God as the bread of life or the staff of life. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sister Dunn, please read for us John 6, 31 through 35. Thank you, Sister Dunn. Now notice Matthew 4, verse 4 says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know, there's different kinds of bread. There's rye bread, there's wheat bread, multigrain bread. There's even potato bread. And there's white bread and brown bread. And there's some bread that don't have any uh, nutritional value in it. And, you know, Beverly Marie and I, we were in Walmart Friday, and Beverly picked up a bag of those bagel, bagels. And I, I asked her, I said, do you like them things? She said, yeah. I said, I don't like them. She said, why? I said, they taste more like cardboard. There's no nutritional value in them, I don't think. But anyway, she likes them, you know. But uh, Jesus is the living bread, and the Word of God is the written bread. Matthew 4, 4, we see the physical bread and the spiritual bread. Now, it's the bread, it is this bread that gives life, according to Exodus 16, verse 15. Now, there's three kinds of Christians. First of all, those that have to be bottle-fed. These are the baby Christians, the young Christians. And then those that have to be spoon-fed. These are those that haven't grown enough to feed themselves too much. Then there are those that are fork fed, those that are able to feed themselves. But we should never tire of feeding the babes and the young ones and even the older ones the Word of God. We should never get tired of that. We find also that he refers to the Word of God as the water of the Word. This is essential to maintain life. And I'm going to ask Deanna, please read for us Ephesians 5, 26 through 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That it should be holy and without blemish. Thank you, Sister Deanna. You know why churches have problems, have church splits and all this? Because... There's certain people that do not want to follow the Word of God. It's the Word of God that cleanses the church. That's what it says right there. Sister Monica, would you please read for us Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither but water of the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, Thank you, Sister Monica. Now, the washing of water by the Word brings spiritual cleansing. And it's the Word of God that gives and maintains life. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, and thou shalt find it after many days. You know, there was a, a man who tore down an old shed close by his house on his property. It had been there for many, 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 many years. He tore that old shed down. He hauled the lumber over to the backside of the lot of his property and he burned it. And that was in the fall. And then 
Spring came and it began to rain. And he said, the seed that had been dormant under that old shed in the dirt for all them many years sprang to life because of the water. And he said it produced some of the most beautiful flowers he'd ever seen. You know, that's the way the Word of God is. It can, it can, it can lie dormant in the mind of a person for many, many years. And then one day, God brings it to the memory of that person. And you know, a person can hear the Word of God when they're a child and grow up not knowing Christ. And when they become an adult, God many times causes them to remember what they were taught as a child in Sunday school or in church. And that person gives their heart to Christ. And we find also that he refers to the Word of God as honey. It is sweet to the taste. I'm going to ask you all to look, look with me over to the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11. It says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. It's yeah, Psalms 19. I'm sorry, did I say 119? Psalms 19, 9 and 11. I'm sorry. My eyes aren't too good. But you know, back before we ever left here, I had eight beehives. I loved working with bees. And you know, and I would, uh, in the fall, I'd go, in, go out and take my smoker and smoke the bees. When you smoke the bees, they'd start eating the honey. And they get so full of honey, they get lethargic and they don't care about whether they sting you or not. And you pull that honey out of there and man, I'd take it home and my kids would squeeze the honey out of that honeycomb and we'd put it in jars and, and seal it up Man, I've always loved honey. But the Word of God is pictured as honey. And you know, there was an Irishman who got saved. Now, this is not the same story. The Irishman got saved out of the Catholic Church. He was sitting reading his Bible one day, and the priest came by and said, You shouldn't be reading that. You shouldn't be reading that. You know, you need to have me to interpret that for you. And the man says, well, hey, it says right here, we're supposed to read it to our children. You priests have no children. <laughs> and, you know, they don't have any children, as far as I know. But anyway, others cannot search the scriptures for you. And the fruit you pick yourself is always the sweetest. And, you know, I thank God for the precious word of God. You know, when I was... When I was in the Navy, they gave us a little Gideon New Testament. In the back of the fly cover, in the back of the cover, said, what must I do to be saved? That's the first time I ever saw a plan of salvation. That's how I got saved. I read that, and it was in the evening time, and they sounded taps, and I went crawled up in my bunk, and I prayed, and I asked Christ to forgive me of my sins and save me, and the peace of God filled my heart like I had never known and he's never left me. We find also that he refers to the word of God as apples. It keeps sickness away. You know, you've, all, you've heard the old saying, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. Well, physically, that's not always true, but it is true spiritually. But you know, I'm going to ask Lisa to please read for us Proverbs 7 and verse 2. Keep my commandments and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. All right, now look, look with me over to Proverbs 25, verse 11. It says, a word, talking about the word of God here, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. The word of God is the greatest of all medicines. You know, there was a drugstore owner back several years ago, who was lazy. He had a lot of remedies in his drugstore, but when people would come to him with some sickness, he, he had like two different remedies that he used all the time. 
And because of that, a lot of people died because he didn't give them the right remedy. And there, then there was another drug, druggist there in his city that sold out to him. And so he, he gathered up all of his apothecary, all of his uh, remedies and stuff, and took them over and put them in the back room of his drugstore, never looked through them to find out what remedy cured what disease. And one day his little son got sick. He got sicker and sicker, and so the man started searching. He started looking through all that stuff to find the remedy to heal his little son, but he never found it. His little son died. And you know, there's thousands of Christians that are just as foolish as that. They never have a family devotion with their children. They never get down on their knees with their children and pray with them. They never talk to them about what the Word of God says for them and how they need to receive Christ as their Savior. And you know, the Word of God is our food. And it is our medicine. And so we need to be faithful in feeding it to others. We need to be faithful in giving it as a medicine to those that are spiritually sick. And there's a lot of Christians that are spiritually sick. You know, last Wednesday, I made a trip down in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And I preached there in the Calvary Indian Baptist Church. And I took a box of chick tracks and I set them on the table, or the pastor, I gave them to the pastor, and he set them on the table. And he told them, he said, now, Brother Sowers brought a, a box of chick tracks. He said, you're welcome to take them. They don't cost anything. And so, before church and after church, boy, people were grabbing into those chick tracks like chickens out of the corn. Because they knew their family members, their neighbors, and people needed the Word of God. That is a great church down there. I had a great time down there. And so anyway, next week we will continue with this lesson on the doctrine of the Word of God. And so next week I'll put lesson number two. I forgot to put lesson number one on here, but I'll do that. I'll try to remember to do that next week. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get ready for church. Our Father in heaven, as we come before your throne of grace, we thank you, Lord, for loving us so much. You willingly came to this old sin-sick world. You willingly laid down your life for our sins. You took our sins upon yourself. You imputed to us your righteousness. Lord, we thank you for that. And we thank you, Lord, for blessing us from day to day, for providing for us and for protecting us. And Lord, we just say, help us to love you more. And God, we pray Lord, now that you bless this morning service as Brother Norwood preaches to us. And also, Lord, in the service tonight. Please keep us all safe on the road, streets, and the highways. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.